You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And we're joined today by former FBI profiler Jim Fitzgerald, Fitz to his friends, and Dr. Raymond Carr joining us to talk about their new podcast, Cold Red. Fitz and Ray, thank you for joining us. Kristen, glad to be back and thank you for having us on. Thanks, Kristen. And you too, Bill, of course. Oh, of course. Absolutely, Bill. We don't want to forget about you. (laughs) And as I recall, just before we started, Ray was bucking to be our favorite profiler and pushing (laughs) Fitz out of the lead spot for our favorite FBI profiler. How did I do? You're doing great so far. You're doing great, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, self-praise is better than none, Ray. That's what my dad used to tell me. You keep thinking you're the best That's terrible, Jim. Like. I'm very fragile. Yes, Take it I, easy on me. I can see that about you. All right. Spoken like is, longtime partners. <laughs> I would say it's pretty clear that the two of you know each other, but go ahead and formalize it for our audience. When did you start working together? And would you call this a friendship or a partnership or what would you call this? Ray, why don't you, you mean, start? Because you mentioned it the other night on our show. When I was in Philly as an agent, I was rolling down the street in my vehicle and I saw this guy who was homeless. And I'm just kidding. All right. All right. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. First time I ever met Fitz, I was sitting on a bank robbery squad in Philadelphia and a lead came in from New York. I, the lead, there was a couple additional questions I had about the lead. And I gave a call up to the agent in New York, James Fitzgerald, and we started talking. And then Fitz wound up going down in the unit. And then we talked and formed a friendship, and it's lasted ever since. So it's uh, more than 30 years. He's he's like family to me. He's, we're very close. And I do appreciate that, Ray. And yeah, and then you were an NCABC coordinator, Wait, National to- Center for the Analysis of Violent Crime Coordinator, which means he had special training in behavior profiling, but he was in the field. And back then, in the early days of the profiling unit, it went by different names back then. I won't bore your listeners and viewers with all that stuff, but we'll just call it the profiling unit. The profilers are basically assigned geographically. And I figured, well, I'm from Philadelphia. Let me just keep the home state. And I basically had New England down, I think, through Jersey and Delaware. So any case that happened in that region, which would need help from a profiler, behavioralist, whatever. Of course, now I'm doing more forensic linguistic work after the Unibom case. And, and anywhere in Philly, uh, and that's a big division up to State College and parts of South Jersey, Ray would be the one that would give me a call. And we worked a number of cases early on. And we solved between Arthur Bomar, serial killer, Ray, we helped solve that. And the Center City Rapist, we certainly played a role in that being solved. So we had some, I was going to say good luck, but we had some good detectives working with us. And we did our best to fill in the behavioral missing pieces. And, and both those cases came together. And of course, a bunch of other ones since then. And yes, so professionally, we've been together for a while and personally same time too and we'll save some of those stories for maybe your nighttime podcast guys <laughs> after dark yes after dark <laughs> after dark oh i don't know bill that sounds like a pretty great idea mind over murder <laughs> after dark i like it <laughs> that sounds great hey great idea fitz i think we're going to steal that if you don't mind go for it and then <laughs> but, uh, your podcast is Cold Red. And so how far along are you with Cold Red? I'd say we're about seven or eight episodes at this point. The first few we just done, just Ray and I, which is not a bad combination. And uh, we had our first guest the other night. Our exa- We have an executive producer, a sound producer, and he wanted to talk about missing kids and child abductions, things like that. And Ray and I both work those cases. We both can talk the talk, but... We both collectively figured, let's let's bring someone in who really knows what they're talking about. So, Ray, why don't you tell them about our first guest ever, and I think he really hit a home run. I was a good friend of mine, 
and uh, Jim also knows him. His name was Kevin McShane, and he was part of the CART team. So when you say CART, what is what does that mean? What does that acronym mean? It's the Child Abduction Response Deployment Team. So it's C-A-R-D-T, but you hear CART, think C-A-R-T. And what happens is he was a member, one of the original members of that team that kind of formed in the early 2000s, and he would be deployed. Predominantly, he was a member of a regional team that handled the Northeast from Maine down to Virginia. But there's times when agents are away or they're involved in caseworks where he would be deployed all over the United States. Usually, they're on scene within the first, if there's locally, usually there's an agent within the first few hours, because time is your enemy in these cases, especially when you have a missing child. He brought a lot of things to the table for us. He explained things very well. I think our listeners were great. They were very fortunate to have someone like that, to be able to discuss that. Whose idea was it for you guys to team up and have this pod? This is clearly a match made in heaven between the two of you, considering all the experience that you have in your friendship. Who stepped forward first and said, hey, let's have a pod? I'm going to start off, Ray, a few years ago, and we haven't talked yeah. about this in a while, but I think you know where I'm going. I do. I'm good friends with a, a very popular sports radio sports show host in Philadelphia named Angelo Cataldi. He actually just retired a few years ago. He wanted to see the Eagles go to the Super Bowl one more time. They didn't win, of course, but so he retired. But a few years before that, we got friendly and we he read my books. He was very encouraging. I actually thank him in my first book, A Journey to the Center of the Mind, my memoir series. And we started talking. I said, Angelo, I think there's room out there for a radio show where we talk true crime. And I said, you work for a station. You've got some pull there. What do you think? I had this buddy, Ray Carr. I think the two of us could really, we could get out there and we could start off right away. Present cases, past cases, anything like that. He's your Fitzy. Always called me Fitzy. That's a great idea. Let me talk to my people. And Ray, I think I called you. And I think within two weeks or so, we had an interview in is it radio station 1210 in Philadelphia right. in downtown Philly. We met there one afternoon around one or two o'clock. And we sat down with this, I don't know, probably 35, 40 year old producer. And quite frankly, we started arguing. We started arguing from the beginning. <laughs> the guy, well, the, you, you argued, Fitz. I didn't argue at all. Uh, <laughs> I was the peacemaker. There's good cop, bad cop. And I guess I was the bad cop that day. But basically, we sat down and we said, hey, we're ready to go. And this guy starts asking us like technical questions about, you know, what it, what kind of equipment you would need. And we were going to come into a studio. This is before people were working from their homes. And do you know what it's like to do a talk show? How much work? I said, yeah, I do. And we're willing to put the work into it. Ray and I have worked big cases together 24, 48 hours in a row and in person or on phone, whatever. I said, we can do this. Give us a good producer. And once a week, two hours, three hours, twice a week, we can do this. And, you, and the guys are, no, you can't. You don't know how hard it is to be a radio talk show host. I said, <laughs> I'm telling you, we can do this. We're FBI retired, and we know how to testify. We know how to talk to people. I give presentation. And basically, a, the one guy just wound up slamming his book and said, yeah, you know, don't call us. We'll call you. And we walked out the door, and there were people going by on their little motor scooters. Remember? I forget the yeah. guy's name. That was one of the sports hosts. And we walked at the door. I called my friend Angelo and said, it didn't go that well. He's there. Yeah, don't worry about it. Let me see, Fitzy, what else I can do. And I said, you know what? All this podcast stuff is coming on board now. Maybe, maybe eventually that'll be the direction we'll go. And quite frankly, I sat back and waited for the right team to come to us. And basically, and Ray was a part of this. And they came to us and said, hey, guys, you're the talent, quote unquote. And we'll put everything together, the marketing and the the admin stuff, and of course, the technical stuff. And about six weeks ago, we, was it Ray, the night of the Nashville shootings, or maybe a couple nights after that. And uh, that was our first or second episode. And, uh, and we've been going at it ever since. So Ray and I try to do this with terrestrial, I guess, radio, they call that. And uh, we wound up arguing with the guy. We didn't get the job. <laughs> we failed the audition. But when our podcast is as thousands of downloads, a week, that guy may be saying, why didn't I hire them back then? That was back in 2015, believe it or not. that was You were just summer, retired, I think. The summer of 2015. I retired in 14. So the summer of 2015, when that came in. And Jim is right. He took offense that Jim believed that this wasn't a big deal. And he says, I've been doing this for 20 years. And I'm telling you, by all means, this is a big deal. 
And I said, I don't think that's what Jim means. He just means it. But it, the, the, everything already went down the drain by that point. So we just figured, all right, no worries. Jim, let's look for a different direction. And Jim's right. A lot of things came and went. And finally, they came to us and they had a nice proposal. And we agreed. Let's see where it goes. Let's well, see where it goes. Fitz, you had done a fair amount of podcasting with Jim Clemente and others on Real Crime Profile. Ray, had you also done guest appearances on other yes. true crime podcasts? Yes, I was on Jim Clemente's podcast, not as often as Jim, but I was on there. I was on a couple other ones. After I wrote a book, the things started to come to fruition in reference to that. And that's another case that Jim and I work, but I was more intimately involved in that book and in that case. And it seemed to be a good story. So I wrote a book and it draw a lot of attention, media attention. It still is. I just well, tell us the title. It's called 30 Years on the Run: The Hunt for the Most Prolific Bank Robber in American History. Wow. And Ray caught him. It's a book with a happy ending. <laughs> it is. It is. It is a happy ending. He's believe it or not, he's actually out of prison now. That's how long this thing. He got 17 and a half years. It's happened back in 2002. So he got out in late 2017 he's he's out of prison and uh, i've tried to and maybe one of these days jim will get a chance to jim and i actually interviewed him and he did a on tape and so we have about a two and a half hour tape of him live while he was incarcerated and mm -hmm. jim and i used that as a training tape for for other agencies looking at bank robbers because he was unique here's a guy that uh, he was not your typical bank robber he began robbing banks in 1973 and was arrested in 2002. Wow. So that's a long period of time. And the funny thing about it is when we first started looking at it, we were only under the impression that he started robbing banks in 1987. So my first interview with him, I said, why don't you, he goes, what do you want, what do you want me to start? I said, why don't you start at the, at the beginning? He says, in my first robbery in 1973, I went, that was like my, first oh shit moment. Wow. I, I don't, I wasn't ready for that. And I said, no, why don't we start when you were a little kid and how you were brought up just to save myself because I wasn't mm -hmm. prepared. But here's a guy that graduated from Villanova with a degree in electrical engineering, went into the military, special forces, but he didn't go in as an officer, which he could have. He went as a non-com. He came out, went back to the University of Penn, got a master's degree in systems engineering, and then went on to Penn State working on a PhD in statistics. So he was very accomplished and very intelligent, but he never worked a day in his life. His job was robbing banks wow. for that entire 30-year period. It seems like such a disconnect, though. This guy with multiple degrees, he's clearly highly intelligent. Why the heck would he go down the road of being a bank robber? I could tell you that, but then you'd have to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to buy 30 Perhaps. years on the run in order and to find tell you out everything the real about it. story. No, I'd be more than happy to come back. And I don't want to take yes. up all the time here. I'd be more than happy to come back and talk about that at another time with both, both you and Kristen, Bill. That's yeah. fascinating. We it would is, love it, that. It is a great story. And I was glad I, I helped. I ran some interference with Ray, but to his credit, it was him and his fellow agents in the Philly division that really put the case together. In fact, you were pretty close, Ray, and then 9-11 happened, and yeah. you had to put everything on hold for, was it a year sure. even, give or take, six yeah, to eight months? About five months. Five okay. months anyways, Jim. So again, eventually the arrest was made, whatever, and Ray can get more into that. But we worked out to do a behavioral, a post-conviction behavioral interview, and we did, in fact, record it. We brought an FBI academy videographer with us and the whole sound thing set up and i guess what do we bring them over to philadelphia division ray we we got him out to on division a, yep on a subpoena of some sort and out of prison and uh, we interviewed him for about three or four hours and a very a fascinating guy and i've done that with a few people in my life even in retirement mm -hmm. uh, with the bank robbers and other sexual assault type people it's frustrating part of you wants to jump over the desk and strangle them not so much carl though the bank robber because he was a polite bank robber. He actually did shoot definitely one person, Ray. Two. And maybe, and maybe, do we have, do we know for well, sure? Well, actually three, but just we take a step back. Talk about jumping over the desk. I had to stop him from that guy at 1210. 
Jim did go over the desk after that guy. <laughs> and I, I had a grab. I'm just kidding. He didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm just kidding. There was, believe it or not, there was one was a bank manager in Jim Thorpe that was shot that almost died. Right. Another was a customer, bank customer That's right. that was coming in from carrying her business earnings from the day mm-hmm. to make a deposit. And he shot her and she had a graze wound on the ear. And then there was a another that he did not admit to, but both Jim and I believe he did. And that was a shooting of a police officer in 1982 up in Columbia, Pennsylvania. And it he denies that he did that. But it just seems that in 1982, he stopped robbing banks and began back up again in 1987. So he took a five-year hiatus. And Jim and I both asked him, why did you stop? He says, I just got tired mm-hmm. of doing it. And I wanted to do something else. So well, what he well, did, go ahead. <laughs> what he did is he started stealing books, textbooks from colleges. And then he would take those books in the back of his van and he would go up to Columbia University and he would post something that books for sale, because they all use the same books. Right. Books for sale, statistics books, math books, economics. And he would sell those. And I said, geez, Carl, how much money could you make? And the time he goes, I'd make $30,000. That's how many books he stole. It was amazing. I said, $30,000. I said, that's unbelievable. Most people in the 80s, you were lucky if you were making seven, dollars $8,000 a year. Before we move on, though, one thing I wanted to ask was, when you told me that, if I'm doing this from memory, he served 17 years or something like that? 17 and a half. That strikes me as a light sentence for someone that actually committed acts of violence during the commission of those bank robberies. Because when you first said that, I thought to myself, this must be one of those gentlemanly bank robbers that doesn't shoot anyone or injure anyone. And yet he actually did injure at least two people. Shooting a police officer, as we know, is deadly serious business here. How did he manage to only serve less than 20 years despite being a violent criminal. He was arrested in 2002. And although the shootings, although very egregious as they were, uh, they were outside the statute of limitations. Wow. As were many of the bank robberies. So there were really only five robberies that were within the statute of limitations. So he entered into a C plea. And what a C plea is in federal court, it allows both the prosecutor and the defense attorney to agree to a sentence before he's sentenced. Now, just because they agree to it does not mean that the judge has to abide. But in many cases, it's discussed in open court and the judge gives, I'll take it under consideration, but usually it works out in the benefit of the offender when that happens. This is fascinating. We got to have you come back here and talk about this case, Ray. Sure thing. Sure thing, Chris. And I'd love to. What would you say are some of the major goals that you have for your podcast, other than telling an amazing story, which you both clearly can? What are your the major things that you want to accomplish as you go through? Fitz, I'll start with you and then kick it over to Ray. Yeah, we agreed early on that I don't think this is too different from legitimate and professional podcasters such as yourself, but we want to make a big part of our podcast about the victims. And, and Bill, no one knows victimhood more than you. You've lost a sister. I've lost good friends, police officers, other friends and robberies and things like that. So it is very difficult. And we want to make sure that why we can joke a little bit as we are now, sometimes in the beginning, sometimes at the end, but in the middle, we're dead serious about the topics at hand. And then we try to give every episode at the end, we try to give some kind of a hints or suggestions or ideas about how a victim can best protect themselves. It may be directly related to the topic we just discussed. It may be indirect to it, but but we could be very basic. It could be more advanced and complex and from street crimes to cyber crimes. It is about the victims. I'll never forget the first crime con in Indianapolis. I was there with Jim Clemente. I'm not sure if you were at that one, Kristen. I know you came to the Indianapolis one. And I think my first one was Nashville. Mine too. Uh, Nashville, I meant. Indianapolis was the first one. And that's where we met, I think, for the first time. But I remember my, Jim was like the MC for the whole thing. And on the stage, said, make sure we have a moment in there about the victims. He said, oh, Fitch, you're right. And he's a brilliant guy. He, but he had so much on his mind. 
Let's have maybe 10 or so seconds of silence for the victims before you we kick everything off. It's a good idea. And I hope CrimeCon, we're not as much involved in that as we used to, Clemente and his company, and I have an involvement there too. But So yeah, it's about the victims, but of course, try to tell a story in between. We're not lecturing anybody. We're not saying, here's what you got to do. But I think the way we try to lay out our individual anecdotes or multiple anecdotes regarding you know different types of criminals who may be committing the same types of crimes. Hey, listeners and viewers at the end, here's how you can avoid being a victim yourself or a loved one. And if by God forbid it does happen, here's what you know you can do to get through it. Ray, you uh-huh. want to jump in too? Yeah, I think Jim said it beautifully. Our whole thing is to communicate to victims that they're not forgotten. No victim is ever forgotten here. So we do talk about things so that we can help prepare those that were victims so they won't be re-victimized and those that have never been a victim to make sure they can avoid things by improving their situational awareness. Situational awareness is such a big part of what people do every single day, but people are so oblivious because they have their heads in their phones or their iPads and are not paying attention to what's going on around them. People need to do that more and more, especially in today's society. You see some of the violence that's occurring and you see some of these things and you look at the violence and people are being just jumped on in train stations in the street. They're being knocked to the ground. So that situational awareness can help prevent you from maybe something like that happening to you if you're paying attention (laughs) to your surroundings. One thing I was wondering about, the two of you are both masterful storytellers. We often talk about cases that you've worked, that you've solved. Are either of you comfortable talking about unsolved cases that you may have worked in the past? Sure. It's part of who we are. Yeah. One of the big ones that sticks with me is a 1992 11-year-old boy from Drexel, Pennsylvania, that was down at the shore in Cape May. Mark Heimbach, and uh, he disappeared. Cape May, New Jersey, by the way. Yeah, Cape May, New Jersey. He disappeared, and they've never found him, and they've never arrested anybody for that. And I remember I was a fairly new agent, maybe five, six years on, and I that winds up falling on me and coming to me, and I just, I still think about that young boy. Mm -hmm. First thing that came to my mind when you mentioned it, that young child, it's still something that, that just bothers me. Where is that young boy? And today, well, that's 19, 1992, he'd be in his 40s. A grown man. Fitz, what's one that comes to mind for you? Yeah, this is, it's easy to remember, but very difficult to discuss. And that is uh, the case of my good friend, Joe Welsh, who was murdered oh, yeah. in a street robbery in Philadelphia in 1997. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was out at Unibom just finishing up there. And I get a phone call, Joe's been shot. He's 42 years old. It was middle of the afternoon in our old neighborhood, in our old Olney neighborhood of Philadelphia. And he lived about two weeks and they finally just pulled the ventilator and he was gone. And street crimes, robberies, hey, give me your money. Probably a junkie. This is not what profilers necessarily, it's not our expertise or tradecraft. Now, I was a police officer, of course. I handled crimes such as this and I helped solve them. But And it wasn't an FBI jurisdiction either. It was a robbery homicide on the streets of Philadelphia. So it was a Philly PD case. I worked with the detectives. I brought another profiler up with me. Uh, We went to the neighborhood. We went to the crime scene and interviewed some people. One guy was arrested but let go. So I'm doing now my fourth and final book in my memoir series. And that's one of the chapters in that book. I recount that case. And I'm still friendly with his... I was actually most friendly with Joe Welsh's older brother, John, who was actually one of the people shot at the first MOVE confrontation in 1978. He was a Philadelphia firefighter, and he caught some shotgun rounds to the neck. I heard this on the radio live, and I actually left. I was working that day and drove down to Philly. He was okay, and and along with a few other firefighters. But but here, 20-some years later, His younger brother gets murdered in a street robbery. And again, it wasn't an FBI case. I didn't have my name on the case file per se, but I said to the PD, I want to help you guys solve this. I said to the family, I want to help you guys solve this. 
And uh, to this day, it hasn't been solved. And I don't want to get too ahead of myself here, but there'll be a special announcement at the time of the publication of my fourth book in which I include this chapter about Joe Welsh. Not that it's solved or I have a suspect, but let's just say something I'm willing to do to help maybe refresh the memories of some people out there. Mm-hmm. So let's hope let's hope that works. And finally, after all this time, we can get some resolution to this one case that sticks in my craw. Was Joe Welsh in law enforcement at the time he was no. killed or he no. was a civilian? No. Nope, he was a civilian. Three o'clock in the afternoon, he had some work for the Philadelphia Department of License and Inspection, walking home from a training seminar to his car in his old neighborhood. And uh, someone just confronted him on the streets. And we have a witness looking out the window and saw everything go down. It was, uh, yeah, very tough to hear all that. But I do stand, I still plan on solving this case with help of the Philly PD. And we can talk about the boy in the box in a bit, but it took 65 years to solve that case or at least identify the young boy. Maybe we can find the person who killed Joe Welsh and let the justice come for that person as as it should be meted. I remember that case, Jimmy. I remember you giving a call up, and I remember running down some leads for you with that up in Philadelphia. I remember that was. I'm sorry, I never forgot about Joe either. I I know that affects you. I'm really sorry that that's that that's something. I appreciate just, that, and we will get it solved. And I'm hoping this chapter in my book and get some more headlines out of it. We can we can bring some closure to it. You got me if you need anything. Thank you, Ray. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. As podcasters, we all sort of work within the same true crime space. And there's always the same sorts of major issues that we talk about in the crime and justice space, unsolved cases and how to solve them, best uses for DNA, forensic genetic genealogy, that sort of thing. What are some of the big issues in the crime and justice space that the two of you want to discuss on the pod? I would have to say violence in general. It's off the charts. It's like a, it's like a war zone. Violence against the elderly, violence against women. There's an addiction epidemic out there. There's a there is huge mental health issues out there. There's a big lack of trust between police officers and citizens. There's a lot of issues that are facing police agencies this year. Think about, and one of the things, I'm on the Police Administration Committee for the IACP. And the IACP is the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And this year's meeting is in San Diego, and I go to the early meetings. But one of the biggest problems with police forces across the country is recruitment and retention. That's just a big thing. And look at the media coverage. When's the last time you heard something pleasant about what the police do? Unless you watch it on a YouTube or a TikTok, or someone sends you a TikTok thing. Nobody ever talks about that. Police are so under the gun that no matter what they do, they're under the risk of prosecution. How do you work under that? What does that do for morale? What does that do for their wellness? Police officers want to be part of the solution, but I don't think the media and the public are giving them the opportunity to do so. What I'll add to that is both directly and indirectly, yeah, I support the police, I'll say 100%, but having said that, I've been involved in the arrest of police officers and FBI agents. If they're dirty, they should go down. Of course, due process, of course, they have every right that everyone else does. But yeah, we do have to give the law enforcement more support today than ever because they are being decimated in in the social media and regular media for that matter. I, I was interested in learning just a few months ago at VDOC of a new term that a prosecutor laid on me. And I was familiar with the term. So let's take it to the next level. Ray discussed what's happening in the streets, the subways, in, in many of our large cities, the crime rates and other places. And so let's say there is an arrest made. Well, now the person goes be, goes to trial and there uh, there's a jury. And for years, we've heard the term CSI jury. And that is, and Kristen, you mentioned some of these forensic capabilities early on when you asked this question. And it's like nowadays or then the CSI jury, if there wasn't DNA, if there wasn't clear full color surveillance video, and of course, throw in fingerprints, they were reluctant to convict someone based on watching the TV show CSI, in which every 42 minute episode with commercials, of course, wound up at being closed because one of these three factors kicked in. 
you don't necessarily need DNA fingerprints or surveillance cameras. There's plenty of direct and indirect evidence. There's plenty of circumstantial evidence that, in fact, can lead to a conviction. What I learned just a few months ago from someone at the VDOC Society, she was a guest. She's a prosecutor in northern New Jersey. Now the term that prosecutors use besides a CSI jury is a Netflix jury. And I said, boy, I think I know where you're going with that, but tell me. And she said, yeah, it's like people now watch Netflix and all these documentaries are about either someone was falsely accused and falsely convicted, or they raise serious questions about the the legitimacy of an arrest and a conviction. And I know with the, I guess the granddaddy of all podcasts, certainly in true crime, was Serial about Adnad, I forget his last name. Sayed. Yeah. And I listened to that and very interesting but I said, after listening to that, I said, we could pick, there's a there's criminal investigation that was broken down into every single element and torn apart every witness identification. And just because something's called a documentary, it does not mean it's 100% objective or even true. Producers, directors, they have their agendas too. Some of them is to sell the documentary. I know that was PBS, I think, or NPR, whatever it was. But, but, but I remember telling people, I said, it's interesting. They do raise some good questions. You can have the best brain surgeon in the world that performs a perfect operation, very complicated, very technical. And then you have a team that comes in afterwards and looks at everything she did and said, you know what? Now, this could have been done better here. Now, now I have a problem with cutting this part of the, the left side of the brain. As a, And I'm just using this, of course, as an example. Sure. So that's where it's also problematic with juries, this Netflix. That they watch these shows that, according to these documentaries, many of these people are innocent and shouldn't be in jail. And the last thing that's not to do with TV, but I teach, I know Ray teaches in academia. I teach at Penn West University. I'm familiar with people teaching at Georgetown University, and there's something very popular in academia right now called the Innocence Project. And boy, it sounds great. And it's all, I'm all for it. I've even helped on a few cases. But you have some of these professors, usually lawyers, academics coming in, and they're convincing entire auditoriums of college students that virtually everyone in prison is innocent. And I think that is unhealthy. It's not the case. Are there some people in prison that shouldn't be there? Possibly, but we're talking less than 0.0001%. And yeah, let's fight for those people. But I think we're getting school of thought put out there now that prosecutions are bad, convictions are bad, and, and in, in jail is good. And I, I know some academics in my field of forensic linguistics, they refuse to work with law enforcement. They refuse to work with prosecution. They'll only work for the defense. But I remember 20 years ago talking to some folks, I would never work a capital case for the prosecution. Okay, I respect that. You don't want to you don't believe in the death penalty, I respect that. But now they've reached the point they won't work with law enforcement or prosecutors offices at all. I said, well, shouldn't the evidence supersede that? You look at the evidence in the case, wouldn't that just you could look at that objectively and say, "Hey, this guy, if it's a linguistic case, he did write this threatening letter or whatever." And they said, no, no, I just, I don't believe in the system anymore. And of course, they're teaching yeah. students. And I just think it could be very problematic that way. Every case has to be looked at individually. And and there's no problem doing that. But I think a lot of these students are being convinced, and lots of, a lot of our public is being convinced, that the criminal justice system is flawed, and it's putting too many people in jail that don't belong there. It's the best system there's ever been. And that's just a falsehood that's being, that's permeating throughout our society that I hope can be corrected. You mentioned the VDOC Society a moment ago, and we know you're both members of VDOC. For the benefit of our listeners, can you explain what the VDOC Society is and how it functions? Right. Go ahead, Jim. VDOC, V-I-D-O-C-Q. It was the name of a French criminal, Jacques or Jean, I forget his Francis. first name. Francis or VDOC. Probably Francois. Oh, <laughs> of course. <my> French. <laughs> Anyway, you remember the name. I didn't, but I've been a member for 15 years. Anyway, he was a criminal in Paris, and they locked him up, and he realized the wrongs of his ways, and he came out, and the police at first hired him just to help out solving crimes, and next thing you know, he became a police officer, and next thing you know, he became the chief of police of the Paris Police Department, and he's considered the first true detective. Sherlock Holmes, of course, was fictional, but uh, Francois... Vidoc was real. And uh, he lived to 82 years of age. So that's why Vidoc only has 82 full members. I'm privileged to be one of those full members, but there are hundreds of, of associate members. And they were founded, uh, really started with the boy in the box case 
That case goes back to the late 50s, but they were reinvestigating this matter in the late 1980s. A few people got together and said, why don't we start this little group, the society? We have these lawyers we know. We have these retired investigators. Let's meet for lunch once a month or so in the fancy Union League building in in downtown Philadelphia on South Broad Street. And it grew from there. Now it's several hundred people strong, and we do meet the third Thursday of every month, and a new case comes in. We're a nonprofit, of course. We actually pay to go to these lunches, and that's fine because we're contributing to the cause. We fly in the departments. Usually you won't get like NYPD or LAPD coming in, and not because one set of detectives is better than the other, but they have the funding and they have the personnel that they can handle a lot of their cases. We we'll usually get smaller to mid-sized departments who come in, and the case is at least five years old. We've had cases there, Ray, probably 50 years old, besides even Boy in the Box. And we'll sit and listen to the investigators. Rarely are the investigators in the front of the room the ones who initially work the case. So we're getting like second or third generation investigators because now there's a cold case squad formed in their department, and they're now involved in it. And they're saying, all right, here's everything they did back then. Here's everything we have in front of us. Can you guys help put these things together. And we have DNA experts. We have profilers, forensic linguists. Ray has all kinds of backgrounds with evidence and hostage negotiation as a profiling coordinator and certainly an investigator. And we have other people that are lawyers and computer people, blood spatter people. And we're all together in one room. There's usually 50 or 60 of us. They do the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Always by dessert time is when the autopsy pictures go up which is strange. Um, oh, God. People oh, God. like Ray and I are used to that. That's why but, I don't um, eat dessert, Jim. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm sitting all it's, it's, I, I don't eat not... dessert. For, to, to, even today, I don't eat dessert, Jim. There's a reason for it. Okay. I'm afraid you someone's going to bring out some pictures. Dead bodies, don't you? At exactly. dessert time. <laughs> well, oh, my God. Go oh, my there. gosh. You and the Sixth Sense kid. But yeah. it's not even planned that way. It's just there's always a few <laughs> autopsy pictures in there. And then we have a Q&A afterwards. We started about two or three years ago. We don't just end it on that day. Say, thank you, detectives. Let us know if anything happens. We now have working teams that we'll assign to each of these cases, maybe a dozen members each with varied backgrounds. And and we'll do our best to do follow-ups with these detectives for months, if not years down the line. And they are very appreciative of their day or two in Philadelphia. And they know they're getting the top quality people who can talk the talk, but also have walked the walk, to use that expression again, in terms of what we can offer them back. And and not every case gets solved because they only bring us the toughest cases. Five, 10, could be 36 years old someday, Bill. But, but there's actually advantages to working cases that are old that you don't have in the beginning. And I know our time is running out here, but allegiances that were very strong back when a murder was committed they somehow fade away when the big tough guy back then, who maybe was the murderer, he's now a little fat, bald guy that doesn't quite have the power base that he used to. And, other, and his cohorts, his ex-girlfriend, ex-wife, whatever, uh, he doesn't instill the fear in them that he used to. So that's a big factor. And what we say, try to go back and interview this person again, re-interview people, maybe have them wear a wire, all legally, of course, check their phone records, things that most investigators will have done already, but, but we try to take them to the next level. And Sometimes they'll come in with one or two suspects. Sometimes it's five suspects or more. Sometimes no suspects at all. And that's when we'll try to paint the profile for them when there's no suspect. But if they have four or five, we'll do our best to prioritize them. Usually we can rule out two or three. Say, I would say it's this number one guy here. I would do everything in your power to eliminate him. And if you do, then go to number two. But boy, everything you've told us, this seems to be the culprit here. And the investigators from all over the country, we've even had them come in from Canada already. They really appreciate the help we can give. And we definitely have solved some cases, including that one that's 65 years old. The one thing that that Jim says, and I'm also a full member with the society, but the one thing that, that Jim talks about is the disciplines. You have to understand that any discipline that you could think of from toxicology to blood splatter to fingerprinting to polygraphy, no matter what it is, there's somebody within the society that has an expertise, that's a subject matter expert in that area that they bring to the table. So we have that the ability that nobody else in this country has is to have every discipline covered looking at it, even genealogy. We have everything covered, which makes us so unique. 
One thing I'll mention, because I know our listeners are going to bring it up after listening to this fascinating part of the conversation, I want to make it clear, the Colonial Parkway Murders families did request that the FBI, Norfolk and Newport News offices take the Colonial Parkway Murders to the VDOC Society, and the FBI turned us down. This was in 2010, I believe. I was involved in the formal request, and they turned us down. And you get the usual bureaucratic answer. It's an open case. We don't feel like we want to bring in outside experts. I'm not saying I wouldn't be willing to revisit that. I know people have said to us who follow the podcast, have you ever considered the VDOC Society? And I know that this conversation will steer people back in that direction. I'd certainly be willing to revisit it, but I do want our listeners to know that we did ask and we were turned down before. I still think it would be a great case for Vidoc, although it's a very complicated case. We've had complicated cases and we can handle them. And every case has to go by its own merits. I'll be careful here, Bill, but I really wish perhaps a new team of FBI agents, and I forgot it was as long as 36 years. What the hell do they have to lose at this point? in a closed society of experts. We're not saying do a documentary, and yet, although that may be down the line, something to do too. I know there have been some media shows on that, but to get really into the depth of this investigation, what the hell do they have to lose after all this time? So Jim, I I disagree with their logic there. I agree with you. But maybe, maybe they maybe have some reason we don't know about. And I don't know, but do we know if this case was ever sent down to BAU? Yes. Or look at. Yes, it's it actually been looked at by BAU more than once. That's still not a problem. There's been cases that have been looked at by BAU that have still come to the VDUC Society. We've been able to help because you get a fresh set of eyes on it, which is exactly what you need. You need these fresh set of eyes to give you some insight that you may not be able to see because your judgment is clouded or because it's so old. But some of the guys in the VDUC Society are pretty old, too. So. <laughs> Not us. Not us. Not me and you, Jim, but there's some guys there and ladies that are pretty old that have been around the block a few times. So they know what to look for. So, uh, yeah, I hope that uh, I hope we get a chance to take a look at that, Bill. I really do. Yeah. And we unfortunately, we can't reach out. The doc doesn't call these local or state police departments or FBI. Hey, we'd really like you to bring our case. It has to be the initiation of the mm-hmm. even the family. They can request all they want to us. They really have to go to the investigative agency itself. Correct. There's a number of cases I'm, of which I am familiar. I would love to just run it ourselves at VDOC. But of course, we can't do that. We need the inside investigators that can really bring us the information that can help solve the case. It's an intriguing possibility without question. So I know both of you are authors. We've referenced Ray's book already, and Jim has referenced his, of course, but let's get it on the record for anybody who wants to embark on a literary journey through your books. So Ray, give us the details about yours and where people can find it, and then Fitz, give us yours. The name of the book is 30 Years on the Run, The Hunt for the Most Prolific Bank Robber in American in History. It's about an individual that was involved in robbing banks for 30 years before he was caught. He's unique. I gave you some insight into that. If you're interested in purchasing this book, you can do so on Amazon, or you can go to my website, RaymondJCard.com, and you can order it right off my website if you'd like to do it there as well. RaymondJCard.com. And Fitz, go ahead and talk about your books, please. Ray, when people buy your books from you, do you give them free signed posters with cool statements on them? Because I do. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> not I knew you, you were going to say it. It's not you and your BVDs or anything, is it, Jim? Oh, jeez. No, Ray. Jim, don't go there. Put your fantasy fun. life aside for a minute. <laughs> All right, just for a minute. <laughs> anyway, my book series is A Journey to the Center of the Mind. All three books have the same title, and I'm now doing the fourth one. It'll be out in, in the fall. And by popular demand, I put the third book. I had a, I hired a professional voiceover guy to do the third book. He did a great job. In fact, it was nominated for an award, the audio book. And it didn't win, but it was still being nominated. It was pretty cool. People said, hey, this guy was great, Jim. This guy was great, but we want to hear your voice. So I said, All right. I put off writing my, I wrote three books in five years and I needed a little bit of a break. And so now just back in February or so, I started doing my fourth book. It'll be the final book in my memoir series, also a journey to the center of the mind. And it will be me narrating the second half of my FBI career and the exciting stuff that happened in retirement in the 15 years since I've retired, but still a very busy profiler and forensic linguist. But I want to add in there too, separate from those that book series, I also did an audio book 
called The Fitz Files, Manhunt Unabomber. And just a few years after the miniseries came out, it was so popular. That, of course, Manhunt Unabomber, it's Sam Worthington portrayed me uh, in, in that series. It's eight part. It was on Discovery Channel, then on Netflix. Now I think it's only on Amazon and the Discovery Channel website. But I did a, a companion piece, if you will, in which it's eight chapters in this audio book. And I, each chapter relates to one of the episodes in Manhunt Unabomber. And I break down for the listeners what actually happened, what didn't happen, why the writers and directors made it this way. And I also interviewed Jim Clemente because he was one of the co-creators of it. The director I interviews, Greg Giantanis, Andrew Sodrowski, the head writer, and a couple of the prop guys are are really cool, too, in the stories they tell in terms of how they make a series from 20 or 25 years back and how they get old fax machines and old computers. And that's just part of it. And even guns and how that stuff works. So A Journey to the Center of Mine is a series, Amazon, and through my website, you get a free cool poster, go through me directly. And, and also Amazon and audio.com or the Fitz Files. Manhunt Unabomber. What's the poster to pick? I was actually going to reach for mine so I could show it to you. Oh, I don't have it. It's not a, <laughs> it's not a Jim to, has a copy. Give Jim a second. It's he not a Jason to well, my desk right now. But it's a pretty oh, good well, looking photo. I can't photo. wait to see this. Ray, you're, you think you're funny here, don't you? No, not at all, Jim. No, Ray's Excuse looking me. for ideas to help market 30 Absolutely. Years on the Run, his book. He wants to be as successful as you are, Fitz. <laughs> Why can't I find them? I don't want to take <laughs> We're seeing the best side of you right now, Jim. Don't worry. <laughs> Let the... Do you know I have mine relatively close by? There it is. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> but if I leave it up there, someone will print it out and copy. <laughs> hey, let me tell you what's happening real quick to me. People are contacting me by mail and online. And Ray, this is going to happen to you. And there's pictures of Ted Kaczynski and mugshots. And they want me to sign them. They say it's for their kids. And their kids are in wheelchairs and hospital beds. And one of them sent them to my actual address. And how did they find that out? And I waited a while. It's a former address now. It really is. All right, your kid's in a wheelchair. All right, you're sick. You're elderly. I signed them. I sent three or four of them off. So it's Ted Kaczynski. It's me at the cabin. They're online. They print them out, nice stock paper. I sign them. You can guess where this is going. They're on eBay. eBay. (laughs) Seventy-five, a hundred dollars. There's a guy now wants my business card because he wants to teach his son how to be Uh enterprising. I'm shaking my head here. Hardworking. Uh, Just sign the business card so he can put it up in his little glass case. I don't think so. uh, And I haven't responded yet, but I'm thinking of saying if you put it on eBay, I want fifty percent. (laughs) <laughs> or whatever, uh, whatever you're earning here. So, did you get my letter, Jim? I asked for money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you sent me your picture, which automatically negated the deal. I can see you whenever I want. I know that's terrible, isn't it? This We're going to have to continue this. <laughs> We're going to have to continue this. This has been an amazing conversation. We're going to invite you on to our show. How about yeah, that? Absolutely, we would love that. Okay, we would love that so much. That is going to wrap for this episode of Mind Over Murder with Jim Fitzgerald and Ray Card. Their podcast is Cold Red. Where can we find the podcast, gentlemen? It's on Apple. It's on iHeart. On YouTube, there's clips there. If you just Google it, Cold Red, it'll pop up and you'll be good to go. Fantastic. The podcast is Cold Red. Jim, Ray, thank you so much for joining us. As always, it is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. That's going to do it for this episode of Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs>